Um, sorry? Did I not do it? No, it's recording. I know. Now, when things start going wrong, you start to, you know, stop stressing. That's too bad. That was, that was a good lecture. <laughs> Um, okay, um, so let's see where we are. We've got a class with properties here, and we're using it. Okay, and just to make things clear, I'm going to get another example. And can you guys figure out what this cl class is doing? Calculates your BMI. Okay, what boring mathematical factorial? Who cares about that, right? This is something that's life and death. So, um, so we compute the BMI, and what are the, what are our properties in this particular class? Weight, height, and BMI. Okay, even though we have no BMI variable. Okay. Okay, um, and I'm using I'm using the BMI here, so I'm saying BMI spreadsheet is a new BMI spreadsheet, and set height, set weight. And then we are doing print line BMI dot get BMI. Okay, so this is a little bit the, the code I showed earlier was not very it's a bit of nonsense code. This is a little bit more reasonable code. Okay. Okay. And now I have put this thing what this this constructor. Okay. So what's what's so what have I what's changed here, and what's the constructor? So the word constructor says it builds the class for you, and that's it builds it, it builds an instance. Okay, um, that's that's sort of that's that's a good name. That's what the constructor seems to indicate, but I don't like that name very much. Um, anybody else want to? Yeah. So. It creates, it creates these two, the class with these two variables. So, and, and, oh, no, initial height and initial weight? It, it, takes, it takes, the constructor takes in those two variables and then it sets those two parameters, private parameters, or actually in this case, public parameters, private parameters inside the class. And then so it goes and takes these two parameters and assigns them to this, these two instance variables. Does it also construct the? Does it also construct and copy these two? Can, can construct these two variables in which the values are going to be stored. That's what. Yeah. So, what's your name? James. James and yours? Christian. Christian. Okay, I've asked you that question once before. So, okay. So James said that it constructs these two variables, which is what constructor word constructor should say. And you're saying it does what to the variables? It initializes, it initializes the variables. Does it both construct and initialize? James thinks so. Java does that. This method, you don't see any code here that's creating the variables. The code is just initializing. So a constructor really is an initializer. Okay? It's an initializer that's called at construction time. Maybe that's what the C++ guys with Michael Kernighan was thinking. Okay? Smalltalk did not have constructors. Uh, that's a term that C++ invented. And, and we see that we, we are, how, we, how we use the constructor. So earlier we would have said new BMI spreadsheet. And the BMI spreadsheet would come up with the values of for height zero, weight zero, and what would the BMI value be? The new zero in the numerator, zero in the denominator, the value would be null error. Would it be a number? If I say get BMI, I can do that. I can say new BMI spreadsheet and say get BMI. In my code, I didn't do that. It was very good. But Java would let me go and create the object and then call the method immediately. So when the numbers in the, uh, try this out in Java. Number in the numerator, number in the denominator, and Java will come and say NAN, which would stand for not a number. Okay? So we are preventing the NAN error essentially right now. Okay? And we say new BMI spreadsheet, and we give these arguments, and and uh, that's your constructor. 
Okay, not much magic there. Questions? So when we do when we do new, we are not saying class name. We are saying constructor name and arguments. Okay, and it's just a method, but it's a funny kind of method. Is this method somehow different from the other methods? It's got the same name as the class. It's got the same name as the class. Any other difference? It has no return type. What is the return type? The class. So why go and give the class name twice? The cla you know? So the method name and the type name are the same. That's kind of a funny kind of method. Okay? So constructor name must be the name of the class. Constructor name is also the type of the object returned. And constructors, when we look at interfaces, constructors do not go into interfaces. No, it's the name of the. It's the same name as the class to make, make this convenient. You all, you, new is not followed by a class. The way to think of new is that that the, what follows new is the constructor name and the arguments. And and we wanted to think we want and we don't want to specify the name twice here. So we want to distinguish this method from others. Hence these constraints. Okay. Okay. So, when we did not have any constructor in the code and we said new BMI spreadsheet, then it seems what I'm saying is wrong, right? That there was no constructor, but I said what follows new is a constructor. So, that must mean what? It must mean that every class has a constructor. But I didn't put a constructor in here. So, what happened? Your variable is not initialized, but I can say new BMI spreadsheet. And new BMI spreadsheet, you know, BMI spreadsheet is the name of a constructor. So Java does what? It creates a standard constructor. And it, and, and, but, I, but, so after I compile the class, will my class change? Will the constructor appear in my class? So it must create the standard constructor, not in the source code, but in the, in the object code or the byte code. Okay? So the, it just inserts that constructor. So this class is equivalent to this class, where it creates a standard constructor. It doesn't know what to do, so it does nothing. Okay, and this constructor is called a null constructor, essentially. Yeah. Does it do nothing, or does it initialize your variables to like set up a reference, like zero or something? You know, the initialization um, happens by through Java. Java will just do that, or it happens through the hardware. Okay, the constructor is not doing that. Okay, but yes, those variables are initialized to zero. And that initialization process is triggered by the constructor call. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, you know, we're running out of time, so we'll just start from here next time. Okay. Questions? Questions about the assignment? None? Okay, uh, so your assignment is trying to do two things. It's doing a little bit more of scanning, which should follow the pattern you had last time. So if you did it properly last time, you shouldn't have that much trouble. You just have to do more of the same. And the other goal is to uh, teach you some more modularity. And uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a second part that tests that. And we've done enough to do uh, the, the third part, which I'm saying is looking ahead. Uh, but because, because of time, time issues, I'm, I'm not requiring it, okay? even though we've done enough in the lecture. But if you do have time uh, this week, then why not go ahead and do the, the last part also? Okay? No questions? Okay.
Okay, uh, so where we left off was here. Uh, we have looked at um, we have looked at many classes. Some of those classes had had only static methods, and those we said were classes that just served as walls in a big program. Then there were these classes we defined that had instance methods, and these classes are not just walls; they're types. Okay. And when they are types, these classes can be instantiated. They have instance methods. They have instance variables. And we saw um, the class that held the factorial for you. Okay, so it held a number and is factorial for you. It was a bean class. Okay, it had getters and setters for uh, properties. Okay, so we defined what properties were, and and then we looked into constructors, and we said constructors are special kinds of methods that are used to initialize the instance variable. And, um, and we also looked at another class besides the one, uh, so we looked at factorial, a class, a factorial bean, and then we, then we looked at a BMI spreadsheet bean, and, and this is the BMI spreadsheet bean, and uh, uh, again, just to get things clear in your head, uh, what are the properties here, before we go to constructors, just let's remind ourselves, what are the properties and what are their types? Okay, again, this is a common misconception. That's why I asked you this question. So those are the instance variables. If those are the instance variable, if, if instance variables equals properties, then why would I go and use another word, right? So those are not the properties. Those are the instance variables. In, instance variables and properties have some correlation. Yeah. Okay, so the initial weight and initial height are parameters to the constructor. If I didn't have this constructor, would I have still have the same properties? The properties are defined by certain methods, and yeah. The properties are weight, height, and BMI. Fantastic. The properties are weight, height, and BMI, and they have nothing to do with the instance variables. They have something to do with the instance variables, but you don't look at instance variables. You look at what to define the property? The public methods that are not constructors. Constructors don't define properties, okay? Because constructors are not getters or setters. You look at getters and setters, and a getter is something that returns a value. Setter is something that takes an argument and is essentially being used to assign a value to the property. So set weight is being used to assign a value to the property. Who knows how the property is stored, okay? But it's somehow assigning it so that when you do a get weight later, whatever you last assigned will be retrieved. That's a constraint, yeah. Uh, so just kind of like a quick clarify, uh, so when you want to identify the properties that we're going to look at, so we're going to look at the properties. Yes, when you look at, when you define properties, you don't look at variables. Right. That's why, you know, when people say, oh, your assignment means I have this variable. Right. I don't mean that. Yes, that may be a way to do that, but I'm just saying you have a property and I don't care how you're storing it. Okay? So please get rid of this thing about internal storage. Internal representation and external representation. We, we defined property as something that's an exported unit of state. Okay? And you have to look at the public methods. Then you have to go in. Which of these public methods happen to be getters and setters? And, and, and uh, each property is typed. And the type of the property is also the type of the getter. Uh, type of the value returned by the getter. And is also the type of the value uh, that is a parameter to the, to the setter. Okay? And the constraint is that when I go, so when I go and set a property, I'm essentially assign and, and I pass a value to the setter. I'm taking that value that's being passed and assigning it to the property, essentially, logically. Physically, inside the memory, who knows what's happening. But logically, I'm saying I'm assigning it so that when I do next to get, I should get back that value. Okay? Now, look at this set. Uh, so, th so this and, and, and BMI happens to be a property that doesn't have a variable in it, and that's okay. okay? That's its internal job. Okay? Okay? Okay. Yeah. So you said this was a BMI bean class? Yeah, this is a, any class that has getters and setters ha is a bean class. Okay? It could be static getters or it could be non-static getters. Okay? Do you remember we classified properties? Yeah. Anybody remember? Various kinds of properties, dependent, independent, and anybody else want to answer? Is, is a setter optional or not? 
if I don't have a setter, what kind of property might it be? Read-only property. Okay. Now, you could have a setter without a getter. Um, let's just assume that never happens. Okay. That gets a little confusing. Because just writing, you never know what you've written. I mean, that, that may be okay. Uh, but in, in this class, we'll assume that you have to have a getter. Okay. Other things? Okay. Uh, but that's not what the purpose of this slide was. The purpose of this slide, I'm just reviewing things before, before uh, you know, we did last week. Now what we said was that we want to have constructors, and we saw that we can have constructors, and we saw that the constructors can be used. And constructors were what again? They were used to construct the object, or were they used to initialize? Okay, they are basically initializers. But you know, they're called right after constructing, so you might think of them as sort of doing the construction also. Okay? And, and the purpose is to go and, and assign values uh, to these properties. Okay? To, to its, basically, it's, yeah, to, to its properties uh, or, basic, or to its instance variables in general. And we have two constructors here. One constructor that takes no argument and does nothing, essentially. Okay? And at least apparently does nothing. And this constructor takes two arguments and, 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 and basically calls the set methods to go and initialize them. Back. Okay? So we saw that we can, have a, we can have no constructor, in which case, what will Java do? Create a default constructor in the object code. Okay? And we can have a constructor, <coughs> we can have one constructor uh, which, uh, which, which takes parameters, in which case we have to supply these parameters when we, when we instantiate the class. Okay, in which case we cannot use, we cannot instantiate the class without parameters. So the reason I'm having two constructors here is because I want to instantiate the parameter class with parameters and then call setters myself. Or I might go and initialize the class with the parameters and then I don't have to call setters to initialize. <laughs> okay, and does it make sense to have, and we saw that the setters is just a method. Its name is the name of the class. Okay. So when I have these two constructors, I essentially have two methods with the same name, and that's allowed in Java. And, and what's a technical term for allowing two methods with the same name? Overloading. Overloading. Okay, we, do we see that in the English language? Do we see overloaded? Well, yes. Can you give me an example? Fly. Okay, so the fly... Um, a plane flies or a fly flies also. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, so that's the same concept here. And we need context to decide. Java needs context. When you give a method name, it has to know which method to call. And so it needs the context and to decide which one of these two uh, methods to call. And what context does it use? What's the context that disambiguates? Yeah. The parameters. The parameters. Okay, yeah. Okay. So it's got to have, if, if two methods have the same sequence of parameters, okay, then Java says, I don't know which one you're calling, and what will it do then? Give an error. Okay, so if you define two methods with the same parameters, it'll say, sorry, duplicate method. Okay? So two methods, so we have an overloaded constructor, and the list of parameter types are different, um, and the return type is never used. In, 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 in disambiguating. It gets very confusing for Java to go and use both parameters and return type. So it just uses uh, the, the um, um, parameter type. Okay? And you see here now uh, both constructors being used. So I first go and I instantiate uh, I instantiate BMI spreadsheet with no parameters and I then go and say, okay, I'll set them. Or I could have done this also, okay? I, equivalent, I can say new BMI spreadsheet 1.77,75, and they're both equivalent. Okay? So it seems constructors are optional, no? You can have them, or you can initialize afterwards. In fact, some, many languages didn't even have constructors. Okay, so can you, can you consider a situation where you just have to have constructors? I mean, here I just showed you. I, I can, supposing I just had no, had no constructors, which means I had a default constructor like this, and I would call setters later, okay? 
Or I could have, uh, I could have done this. So I could have done work this way. It's a little bit more work each time I instantiate the class. This time that, that all that work is done once for me by the class definer. Here I have to do the work myself as a class user. So this is certainly convenient. Can you see constructors being necessary in certain situations? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that kind of professor, have you ever met before? <laughs> I'm going to require you many things, okay? Okay, so forget the professor. You know, you're all on your own. You're totally independent, licensed to program. In certain situations, so I'm just saying, you can you can initialize yeah yeah. Well, I was just gonna say you might want it might be necessary with initial conditions that you have to set are unimportant to the user. So you're saying that you know a class shouldn't have ever be in some inconsistent state. Yeah. For instance, your height and weight should never be zero. Yeah. That just makes no sense. So maybe you know just to guarantee some integrity in the in the class, you should have these parameters, and probably you shouldn't even define this constructor that allows you to have zero zero. That's excellent, excellent reason. Other reasons? Yeah. Um, it might be like a read -only. What if your properties are read-only? That means the class is not defining any setters that to allow, them, allow you to change the properties. So what if some properties read-only? That means that its value is only supplied when it's been constructed and not later. And do you know of any class that has only read-only read state? It has no writable state? A class that you've actually used. So integer is that you're saying capital I integer? Okay, that's actually true. But you haven't really used integer. You've been using ints, I assume. And you're you're you're, you're kind of right there. Some other class that's even more important for the two assignments for the first hand. String. String is an example of a immutable uh, object. So that's a question, you know, I can go and do, do things either way. So when, I, when, when are constructors necessary? And uh, so that's, you know, I'm just going through this, this stuff. So these two statements are more or less equal. They're not quite, okay? But think of them for now as being equal. So you can say S is assigned hello, or you can say S is assigned new string hello, okay? And hello is being passed as a argument to the constructor of the string class, okay? And now, once you've assigned, once you've created the object hello either this way, this way or in this shorthand, uh, this particular thing within strings, within quotes is called what kind of entity in a programming language? So n the number five, the number 6.8, the thing within quotes is called, yeah, a value, yeah, a literal. A value that's been literally provided to you. Not a value stored in a variable. Not a value stored in a constant variable, which doesn't change. It's literally a value. It's very convenient. You don't want to say new each time. So this is just a convenience thing because strings are understood by the language. They can do this. Okay? String is immutable. And an immutable object cannot be changed after initialization. So an integer, like 5, integer is kind of funny because it's, you know, it's kind of a uh, not uh, object, kind of a not object, which is called primitive. So, but strings are is, 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 um, easy, easier to understand. And an immutable object with state must have some constructor. So a string cannot be defined without a constructor, okay, because there's no way to set its value. So... What's happening here then? I never taught you guys this, this operation um, because I didn't really want you to use it in your first assignment. I'm saying ass assign to um, string s hello, then I'm assigning whatever the value is in s to the variable hello. Okay, that's just showing you I'm changing the variable. And now I say s plus equal to world. What does that really mean? What, so, okay, so what does that really mean? Yeah. Append world to S. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. The plus operation, something you, you're used to in mathematics, applies also to strings. Okay, that's something you guys, some of you were trying to use this or maybe have even used it in your first assignment. That as you went through each digit, you just appended to, 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 to a string 
as you went forward, rather than doing substring, which is what I really wanted you to, to, to use. Okay? Is it really a pend? Just concatenation. Is concatenation? Uh, so basically, the string hello got elongated. Is that what happened? So what exactly happened? Okay, so it created a new string with the with the uh, to which and took the uh, made a copy of the original content and appended to that the word. Okay, and if I go and say. Is S the same as hello right now? The answer would be because it created a new string. Okay, uh, hello. The, the variable hello still contains the old object, and this guy contains now the new object. Okay, so that's important. So S is now being plus four. Or S, S is a, S is a name. Okay. What is in, S? in S is. What do you? Hello world, a new object. Hello world. Okay. Same. Fine. But I'm just thinking, can't you not compare two strings with equals equals? You can always compare anything with equals equals. It okay. So you know what is really what does equals equals do exactly? It it checks if the two variables hold the same value. Okay. And, we, and, and for, to, to understand this properly, we need to know how objects are stored in memory, I guess. Okay? But equals equals is something you can apply to anything. Yes, your teachers must have told you that don't use equals equals for strings. Use the equals method, which we haven't gotten to right now, because in many cases you want to do that. Okay? But when you want to see whether the two objects are the same, then you say equals equals. When you want to say, see whether the two objects hold the same contents, you use the equals method. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm trying to see whether they, they, those, those two objects are the same. Yeah. Both Yeah, so to, to see when two objects are equal, you're saying do they hold the same value in memory, and that's what you use, equals equals. Okay? So, so uh, when you have two strings that are stored at two different places, okay, then that's when, and, but they're equivalent, they're both hello, then you would use the equals method. Okay? When you have two integer values, you know, you assign to variable A5, you assign to the variable B5, the number 5 is stored only once in memory. Java says, I know where 5 is, I don't have to go and store the number 5 10 places. So yes, when you go and compare A with B, they will be, and you say equals equals, they'll be the same value. Lots of questions. Okay, let's go from here. What's the difference between concatenation and appending? From uh, where do uh, you mean this append here, or general English language? General. The same thing. Okay, that's. I mean, I don't know. You guys, anybody else? In English language, I, I suppose they're the same. Okay. That's at least how we computer scientists use that. Okay, yeah. So the string out of chapter one, will it only print out if that's true, like S equals equals hello? Okay, so well, that's interesting. You're used to printing numbers, you're print, used to printing strings. What does this mean, printing S equals equals hello? This, this, this is an expression that returns a Boolean value, and print line can be used to print any value. So it's going to return, what value is it going to print? False. Okay. Uh, uh, let me go with you here first. Yeah. Um, why are you doing S plus equals hello and not uh, hello plus equals uh, Because I just want to go in, you know, I, I just want to show you that I'm changing. T uh, I could do either way. That I want to just show that when you change one, when you do a plus you, and you assign to that, uh, when you do plus, the variables get assigned a new object. That's what I'm trying to show. Okay? So I'm trying to show that um, S is now holding another object. That's what I'm trying to show. Okay, this, this is not a meaningful program. Okay? In some sense, it is meaningful because hello always contains the string hello, 
S is this funny variable. Who knows what it means? Sometimes it contains hello, sometimes it contains hello world. So logically, it's making sense. But this program is not doing anything useful. It's just showing you that we get a new object. And this is very important. String s is, is, is equal to hello, bef sorry, say that again? I'm changing the variable, but I'm not changing the string. Okay, so that's like saying you have Mr. Professor here. Okay, today it's me. Tomorrow I might go somewhere else. One of the TAs might be the professor. So the Mr. Professor is pointing first to me and then to somebody else. I grow a mustache. I, you know, I, I do other things. I have changed. Okay, so the object has changed. So that is that is so so that is a mutable object, whereas the variable can point to something once, another thing, another time, and the, the variable is pointing to different objects at different times. It's just a name. Okay. So have you changed the object? Have you changed the variable? That's ex ex exceedingly important concept. Okay. Uh, there was, yeah. Um, if you can do the concatenation of pairs, uh, what is the benefit of doing the there? Okay. So I haven't even looked at this so far. Okay, we we haven't gotten past this. Have you gotten past this? Is this is to come later? Okay, uh, uh, more questions about this part? Yeah, I'm just saying changing variable and not changing the object. Okay, now we come to the verses part. Now you know every time you want to create append something, if you have to create a new object, that's inefficient. So wouldn't it be nice if Java had some something to allow you to just add to an existing object? Okay, and, and in the case of string. The string type is, is immutable, but there's a, there's a companion type called string buffer. There's even another type of whose name I'm forgetting right now. Um, and that's a string buffer. Okay? And string buffer is, has got operations like append. So you're now changing the object itself. You're not changing the variable, but the object. So you're saying, please append to whatever object S points to her world. Okay, so it's like I've come now and put a cap on my head. So I've changed. It's not that the name is different. Okay, so now what will S equal equal hello uh, uh, print out now? True. Same object. You've just changed the object. So the, the, we have two names to the same object. You change the object. Both names still point to the same object. Okay, hang on. In here or here? So if I said S equals equals. Yes. Because they're both the same. They're both the same. So you're printing them out. So it's, yeah, you get the same. More questions? Um, in practice, why would you want two names for the same object? Why would you want two names for the same object? Don't you have multiple names for the same person often in life? Uh, you know, you're, you are, that's called aliasing. And as it turns out, aliasing is very, uh, it's, it's a mess. If you want it, but aliasing creates real problems in compiler optimization. And, um, when, whenever I go and pass an object as a parameter to a method, I'm creating two names. That parameter is pointing to the object and my variable that I use, the formal. So let's say I have that value stored in some global variable. And I go and call a method with that parameter. I'm creating two names. Okay, so it's just, there are other good, good effects of this. But yes, otherwise things can get confusing. What, are you talking the bottom one or the top one? So hello is a variable. And I just said that both names should point to the same object. Right? And now I haven't changed hello anywhere. I haven't changed s anywhere. So those two names are still pointing to the same object. It just so happens that the object changed. I could have said 
S dot append, I could have said hello dot append, the effect would be identical. I could say professor do this, I could say Mr. Professor do this, same effect. It appends world to the object hello. Remember, this is the object, this is the name. You have to really make, make that clear in your head. There's a name and there's an object. There's the person teaching, there's the, what you call him. Okay, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah. So what do you think? If I was to ask you in an exam right now and there was pressure, you had to answer, what would you say? So whenever I go, how do you create an object? You take a class and you instantiate it. It so happens that when you go and put this literal here, it's shorthand for saying new string. More or less. There's a little few subtleties there. Okay. So this is the object. And what's the name? No, that's the name of the type. What's the name to this object you give? S is the name. And then I said, I'm going to confuse you. I have a nickname for you. I have a proper name for you. They're going to use them both. Okay? So those are the names. And a name can point to one object at one time, another object at another time. Ashman. So the value of the object S is hello. Hello is the object. What did you say S was? S, S, S is the variable. It's a name. This is the object. This is the name. Okay. Okay, so how arrays are allocated, how things are allocated. You know, some of these things will be a little clearer, I think, in a couple of minutes. And so array is something, let's just say, you know, we don't quite know how it's represented. Okay, but let's go and understand first how the objects are represented in memory. So I'm, I think I'm going to come to that in a few slides. But more, yeah. In the, no, in the first part, I'm not changing the object. I'm creating a new object. <coughs> yes. Totally new object. You want a professor with a hat? You get a new professor and put a hat on him. You want me to put a hat on? I'll put it. That's string buffer. Okay? And you can imagine that if they have to clone me and then put a hat, that's pretty expensive. Okay? So you want to, you want to rather, you know, so be careful with that plus operation. It's not just... Appending. It's creating a new copy and then adding. Okay? I should. And so the second line in um, the second box is just changing the name. Of... It's changing the object, string buffer. It's changing the object and adding world to it. It's putting a hat on the, on the professor. Wait, the second one, though. Oh, here? Just putting a different name, Professor, Mr. Professor, whatever. Okay. okay? If I change the, if I change hello, will it change S? Okay. <laughs> bottom box, top box. On the, on the, on the bottom box. If I say hello, that pen. Yes, there's two names. You say Mr. Professor wear a hat, you say Professor wear a hat, same effect. We are just one person. There's one type called string, one type of string buffer. String buffer is capable of changing. Okay? And one guy says, I'm, when I was born, I'm, I'm going to stay as I want to, you know, so uh, I'm not going to change. That's it. More hands? Okay. Assigns to S a new string object, does not change the original string, does not reassign. Okay, so, you know, I really should have called it SB to make it clearer. I guess I'd planned to call it SB, but I never did. Uh, that's a string buffer. And changes the object to which SB points. Okay, so I'm using, I'm using a third name here, which doesn't even exist in the program, which is what I intended to use. Uh, but this, we'll, I'll just correct the slides to call this S now. Okay. And reassigning a new object less efficient. 
Okay, so so th this this thing is less efficient than that. Okay, so this one's going to return false. This is going to return. This is going to print out true. Okay, which is what we went through. Okay, now you you have all these questions about memory, and perhaps I should have talked about this before I talked about constructors, but let's go and try to understand how objects are represented in memory and how and how primitives are are, are assigned in memory. Um, are represent memory. So we know what objects are. Objects are, are what? How would you define an object? In terms of another name we know? Instance of a class. Fantastic. And what's, what's a primitive? So in, in this program, what are the primitives and what are the objects? So anything that's not an instance of a class. Any value that's not an instance of a class. And the word primitive means to you in English something that it's just used to construct other things. You construct maybe objects from primitives. And can you can so there are object types and there are primitive types. So can you tell me what an example of a primitive type might be here? Double. Okay, so <clears throat> there are primitive values and primitive ob uh, variables. There are object values and object variables. We know what object values are. Object values are instances of classes. <coughs> object variables are names that point to object values. Okay? Primitive values are values that are not inst instances of classes. Okay? What are they? There's some magic that comes you know, before the world is born, created almost. Okay, and uh, different languages have taken different philosophies here. The language small talk did not distinguish between objects and primitives. It just said everything is an object. Okay, that made life easy because I don't have to tell you two sets of rules. Okay, I don't have to have the slide object versus primitives. I can teach you things more efficiently. You don't have to remember two sets of rules. Then came C++. It said, you know, I already have C, which doesn't have object-oriented um, concepts in it. I'm going to add to it object. So by definition, I'm going to have both primitives and objects. And then came Java, and the question was, were they, good, good? they were designed to be object-oriented from ground up. You would have thought they would go as Smalltalk did, but for various reasons, having mostly to do with efficiency, they decided to go and have two separate things. Okay? And because they have two different things, it's quite confusing, especially for those of you who are learning programming or who are at the beginning stages of your programming career. Okay? So... Did you say that BMI spreadsheet variable name is primitive? Did you? Was, okay. So that's going to be a, an object variable. This is an object. The number 1.77 is a, is a primitive. Okay. And uh, computed BMI is what kind of variable? Double variable. And so it's an object variable or a primitive variable. It's a what kind of a primitive? Because it holds a primitive value. Okay. OK. And how can we tell in Java whether some type is primitive or object? I mean, you can memorize things, or you can use some rule. OK, if you have to do a new, then you know it must have been an object. But how do you know whether you should do a new or not? The program yells at you, but how can you avoid yelling in the first place? Okay, so the names of primitive types start with lowercase, and the names of object types start with the capital letter. Remember we gave you these rules before? Class names should begin with the capital letter. That's why we were giving you this rule, so that you can, you can know the difference. Okay? So this is an object value. This is an object variable. This is a primitive value. This is a primitive variable. Okay? Now let's get into... Oh, so, my, you know, I should have looked at this animation before I came. Let me just show you the whole thing. Okay. Uh, and I think probably I have more. Yes. More? Okay. Uh, let's go and see what's happening here. I have computed BMI, a primitive variable. 
So this is, this is the difference between name and value. The value is what's in memory. The name is what I label, label I put there. Okay, the name is something that's kept only during program writing time. At runtime, when the program is executing, the name is replaced by what do you guys think? No, so, so the name S, the name hello, is something I just keep as a bookkeeping stuff that I keep when I'm writing the program. By the time the program is compiled, it is replaced by a? Location and memory. Okay, Mr. 63rd, 25th. Okay, that's the, 25th, the, 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 the chunk of memory starting at the 25th location. The chunk of memory starting at uh, the 64th position. Okay, so that's what it really gets replaced by. Okay, so now what you're saying here is seeing here is um, the number 22.5 is somewhere in memory. Okay. <laughs> And we have given it a name, the name computed BMI, which points really to the address of that, whatever that address is. I haven't put that in. Okay? Weight is also going and pointing uh, to another uh, implemented variable, a value, and this is the value. Now, when you have a BMI spreadsheet, you have some chunk of memory allocated for each instance. Remember, instance variables are duplicated each time you instantiate a class. What does that mean? that each time you instantiate a class, Java looks at all its instance variables, allocates a, a, a block of memory for all of them, and, 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 and that is representing the object value. So if you were to append world to that chunk of memory, it gets a little tricky, right? It has, how, do you, how do you expand it? It gets tricky. Okay, so uh, that's why immutable objects are useful. Um, so with BMI spreadsheet, you have two variables, height and weight, they're both allocated values, okay? And the name BMI spreadsheet is pointing to hold some value. It's, it's, it, 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 and, and that value is, I'm saying 52 here. So what does that 52 mean? It was previously in that memory location or it's currently in that memory location? So can you see a 52 here? You see a 52 here also? So this 52 underscore must mean what? So what should it, what should the, so, so this variable here directly holds the value, okay, computed BMI. This variable here should hold in your mind, what, what value should it hold? Sorry? The memory address of the start of the block holding the object. So 52 happens to be the memory address of the first word in memory for that object. That's, that's why I put the 52 here. It's kind of hidden. Okay? So you hold the address of the chunk of memory that holds the object. That's the difference between primitive and, and, and object. Primitive variable directly holds the value. Isn't, you don't go and allocate the value, then you go and figure out what its address is and put that address in computer BMI. You just put the value right there. Here, you go and actually put the address of the location of the first location of the start of the block of memory that's allocated for that object. Okay? So changing a variable value would mean BMI spreadsheet sometimes points to this BMI spreadsheet value, sometimes another BMI spreadsheet value. Changing the value would mean, uh, object itself would mean messing around with that memory allocated for that object. And all names would then refer to the changed value. Okay? So whenever you create an opt class, you declare some instance variables. Whenever you instantiate the class, you create, you create a block of memory to hold those instance variables. Every time you instantiate a class, you hold, create, dynamically create a block of memory to hold those values. That's what the instance variable means. Static variables, they are allocated once. Okay? And a particular vari a variable will hold the address of the block of memory allocated for that. Okay? The block of memory has many words, so it holds the address of the first, very first value. Okay? I have another slide that will make things clearer. So now I have, and, and these things I have, I have, so does this make sense? I have 64 here and 52 here in this BMI spreadsheet variable. Okay? So... 
This 52 is pointing to what? This block of memory. And this 64 is pointing to this block. Okay? And the block of memory itself has got some primitive values in it. Height happens to be a primitive variable, double variable. So it holds this value directly. If there was an object variable here, it would hold an address to that block of memory. Okay? So you see now here two different uh, instances of the same class. They have the same number of instance variables. They're the same size of block of memory, but they hold different values. And your two uh, variables hold the addresses of these things. Questions? Okay, let's just to see whether we understand this. What's going to happen here? What's, what's changed here? I have a BMI spreadsheet variable to which I never assigned an object. Java will let you do that. Okay, sometimes. Sometimes it won't let you do that. I have a computed BMI primitive variable to which I did not assign a value. Okay? So both of these variables have been left unassigned. I go and print line computed BMI. So even though I've assigned no value to computed BMI, I say print it. Even though I've assigned no object to BMI spreadsheet, I say set height and set weight. Okay, so I have got an uninitialized variable. That was kind of bad. And what's worse is I use these uninitialized variables. Okay, is there anything bad going to happen visibly? So what's what's what what's what's going to happen when I say BMI spreadsheet dot set height one point seven seven? You'll get a null pointer exception. And and can you imagine why that word null pointer? Why it says what the null pointer really means? Yeah, it's the variable BMI spreadsheet is pointing absolutely nothing in memory. It's pointing nothing in memory. Okay. Now you see that null pointer exception must mean that an object variable holds a pointer, an address to some block of memory. Okay? And when I say print line computed BMI, will I get a null pointer exception? Does a primitive variable hold a pointer to the value or the value directly? So it's not going to, if there's going to be an error, it will not be a null pointer exception. It will be some other kind of exception. So this BMI variable, spreadsheet variable, what address does it actually have in memory, you think? What value? What is the address? There, there was 52 and 64 stored previously. What number is stored in BMI spreadsheet variable? Guess. I mean, it has to store some value. What do you think it will store as the pointer value? Zero. Okay. When you go in and what about, what about this variable computed BMI? You didn't initialize it. What do you think that memory is going to hold? Zero. Is zero a legal double value? Sure. But is zero a legal pointer value? No. Okay. So that's what this shows. Here I've assigned, when I, when I don't assign anything, I've got just a zero value, which is a legal value. And it says, sure, you probably were just being lazy. You know I'll initialize things to zero. So, you know, I'll, I will do it to zero. Okay? Here you have a null pointer, which is also represented as zero. It says that is a bad pointer. We know we don't allocate any, let you allocate anything at the zeroth address. Okay? So you'll get an illegal value, and so you'll get a null, null pointer exception. Okay? So beware of this. In the next assignment, you have to create objects. Okay? If you follow the pattern in class notes, you're not going to go very wrong. Now, at least. But later you will, when you don't look at a pattern, when it's not so so systematic, um, and when it's not so, so much a um, copy of what I did, yeah. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. Okay? Anybody know when it does and when it does not? It keeps changing also, so I, I have to keep up with this. If in an instance variable case, it does not. For a local variable, it will complain. Instance variables, it says, you'll probably initialize that, that using some constructor, so I don't have to complain. Okay? So if I say BMI spreadsheet.get BMI, I'll get a so null pointer exception. If you say get BMI, and we saw that null exception is saying, hey, there is no object, there's no get BMI word, to be called, so you get a null pointer exception.
and, the caption, and if you don't catch you it, look you at saw how you can later, catch it, kind of, because we see this in death event, later. As the name says. And I guess that's it.